Siku hizi msia kiomoka ukimeki ito asona kuita the goat Kuchai juulize yo jina goat ilitoka wapi Mbona wasoe witi the cow, mbona wasoe witi the camel The battle line has been drawn and the rubber is ready to meet the road Netizens have ganged up against Pastor T and they are all chanting in unison saying crucify him Round 1, fight this is because of the statement that the pastor made a few days ago concerning the usage of the term the goat. According to the man of God, he went ahead and explained that the usage of the term the goat can be traced back in the book of Daniel chapter 8 where the prophet foretold the coming of a certain king, Alexander the Great, who was going to be under the influence of a familiar spirit or rather a demonic spirit. Five. Bible Nasema, and as I was considering, behold, and he goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth and touched not the ground, and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. In Daniel chapter number eight, nearly kwa prophecy ya the rise of the Greek. Now the lead of the Greek was none other than Alexander God. The mother of Alexander the Great alikuwa mchawi, alikuwa associated na occultism, and it is believed alionekana na the king who was the foster father of Alexander the great alimona akidoz na nyoka and so it was not known whether he was a true son of the king ama alikuwa a product of the gods sleeping with men and coming and so by the time wanaongea kusu the god wanaongea kusu a person that has conquered territories at a very young age and a person that is making headlines and a person that is doing great wonders at a very young age and that's when akuta iyo name the god in a prevail tukiangalia origin pia tunaona kwamba the image of the devil ina kuanga represented by the bumpet and the Bampet na kuanga a man with a human god and a kuanga na image amieka hivi aki point to the heavens. So, will there be connection with demonic, satanic influence over people that are making success and people that are influencing the god very fast? Now, shortly after Pastor T made these controversial statements, netizens came out and started labeling him all sort of names. Some called him a heretical preacher's preacher, others called him a false teacher. And some of us have been hated. But the question is, is Pastor T teaching heresy ama ako tu sawa? Well, let's find out. Karibu kwa mara nyingine kwenye Plug TV, your number one infotainment channel. Kama kawaida, this will plug with every trending story. And I am your very host, Chief Okuzo. Now, if you are a keen follower of Pastor T, you will understand that the pastor has been trending all over the internet in Kenya for a couple of days now. And this is because of the statement that he made recently concerning the usage of the term the goat. According to the pastor, kwa hiyo video ambayo mwana mwana kuna vile wa Kenya hawaja kubaliana naye. Ukiingia pale kwenye mitandao ya kijamii utapata kuna vile wa Kenya wamemwatak, wamemtupia cheche za matusi, wengine wanamwambia he's not a man of God, he's a fake pastor and all that. But the question is, was Pastor T teaching correctly ama alikuwa anahubiri vitu vyake? Tukiingia kwenye maandiko matakatifu kama kawaida, you will understand that disagreements in the body of Christ are always there. How do I know if you go in the book of Acts Chapter 15, there is a scenario that arises between Paul and the disciples of Jesus. This is a scenario that took place when Paul started teaching that if you want to get saved, it is not a must for you to get circumcised. Well, the disciples of Jesus believed that uh, salvation was only meant for those who are circumcised, all right? And this debate brought a very big rift in the body of Christ. It was a very big drama in the body of Christ read the book of Acts chapter 15. Now from there we see different men of God ganging up against um, Apostle Paul. And I'm going to show you why. Wakiangalia uh, Pastor T na vile anafunza na kile ambacho watu wanafanyia hivi to kile ambacho kili mtendekea Apostle Paul. And I'm going to show you why. Now for us to understand where Pastor T came from and started teaching these things, you need to understand how the body of Christ operates. Remember, in the body of Christ, God has provided us with five major offices that helps the body of Christ to function properly. And if you read the book in the, uh, in the, the Bible, in the book of Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11, Paul mentions these uh, offices. Uh, he says that, and he gave gifts many, some apostles or rather prophets,
prophet, apostle, that is the second, third, the, uh, the evangelical, the pastoral, the teaching offices. I'm not mentioning them, uh, village of Watana, but I'm giving you the names of these five offices, all right? Now, these five offices, they help the body of Christ to function. Now, the same way the government of President William Ruto has different ministries that help him run the government, that is how God has created these ministries. In the body of Christ, we call them the fivefold ministries. They help God run his kingdom here on earth. Now, every man of God is called to any one of these offices or rather these five ministries. For you to understand where Pastor T comes from, you will understand where he came from. Number one, you need to know that Pastor T is originally an apostle. If you are a keen follower of Pastor T, you will understand from the days back then, he was called Apostle T Mwangi. And as an apostle, most of the time when apostles come out and start teaching, they sound so controversial and demanding. All right? So, as uh, uh, Pastor T came out and started teaching about this revelation of Alexander the Great, ah, this guy is becoming controversial. Now, the reason why people disagreed with him and the reason why he sounded controversial is because of the statements that he made that some of the body of, members of the body of Christ disagreed with it. The same way in the Bible, in the book of Acts, the statements that Paul started teaching, if you study the history of Apostle Paul, you will understand this guy used to be a persecutor of brethren, all right? Then all of a sudden, this guy who used to kill the disciples of Jesus comes out and tells them, Yoniage, I had an encounter with Christ and I am now a changed man. And to make the matters worse, he starts teaching what the disciples of Jesus never understood. And this somehow never sat well with the disciples of Jesus. Some even felt like this guy is preaching heresy, all right? Because when uh, Apostle Paul came out and said that he had an encounter with Christ, is this guy not trying to lure us uh, and uh, he ends up killing us? No, no. That's what used to run in the minds of these disciples. And to make the matter serious, Apostle Paul started teaching the gospel of the grace that for you to, um, to you, you do not need to get circumcised for you to get to go to heaven or rather to get saved. And according to the disciples of Jesus, they used to believe that the gospel was only meant for the Jewish people and those who are circumcised. While Paul, who was a persecutor of brethren, comes out, says he had an encounter with Christ, and he starts teaching about the grace where you do not need to be circumcised and that the gospel of, of Christ was made for the Jewish and the Gentiles. If you study the scriptures, you will find that this debate brought a very big rift in the body of Christ. To an extent that Peter, the, uh, the disciples of Jesus, came out and started saying some of these things that this apostle Paul teaches are hard to understand. Are we together? So you can see the disagreement because of the statements that Apostle Paul used to make. He sounded so controversial. Now, in the office of an apostle, most of the time when apostles teach, they teach from the lenses of an apostle. When they study scriptures, they study scriptures from the lenses of an of the apostolic. All right. If you go to the office of the prophetic, when a prophet, a prophet studies the scriptures, he studies the scriptures from the lenses of a prophet. And for those who do not know, a prophet is not a person who tells you what you ate yesterday at night and the color of your underwear. No, that is not just uh, what makes the prophetic. A prophet is a man or rather a woman who speaks the counsel of God into existence. How do I know that? If you read the scriptures, you'll find out that the ability to foretell and uh, predict the future is actually the lowest level of the prophetic. The highest level of the prophetic where God wants all of us to operate into is not in the level of foretelling and uh, predicting the future, but rather in the level where we call the prophetic decree. 
This is the level where God has been operating since back then up to now. How do I know that? If you go in the Bible, in the book of Genesis chapter 1, you will see where God decided to operate in this level. After seeing, he started operating the level of the prophetic decree. The Bible says in the book of Genesis that in the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the spirit of God was also moving upon the face of the deep and God said let there be light after God foretell or after God seeing vision wise of what was happening on earth he spoke what he wanted to see he decreed what he wanted to see this is the level we call the the level of the prophetic decree where all of us need to operate into we should not just get comfortable in the level of foretelling things and um, operating the, in, in, the, in the gift of word of knowledge, all right? God desires you and I to operate in the level of the prophetic decree where we operate like him. How do I know that? If you read the book of Job chapter 22, the Bible says, if you decree, you shall decree a thing and it shall be established. You will understand that in this level, we operate by decrees. Kings rule by decrees. In this level, we speak contrary to what we have seen. Are we together? If you also read the Bible in the book of Ezekiel chapter 37, you will see something interesting happening there. The man of God in this particular verse talks about the valley of the dry bones. I'm showing you how the prophetic operates so that you may know uh, when a prophet teaches how they how they functions and why they sound so demanding and commanding in this level of the prophetic decrees in the book of 37 uh, Ezekiel 37 you'll see the man of God over there he says that he saw a valley with dry bones all right and then God told him he needs to prophesy on these dry bones that they may receive life uh, verse 2. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley. Please note here, after he saw vision-wise, after seeing, or rather operating the ability of word of knowledge, after seeing the, the, the valley of the dry bones that were very dry, then God asked him, Son of man, can these bones live? And verse 4, this is what God tells Ezekiel. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. All right. Now you, after reading this verse over here, you will understand that the prophetic is not made up of just foretelling and operating the word of knowledge. The prophetic is made up of a different can I call them elements? And with the biggest element is called the element of prophetic decree. Are we together? So in this level, this is where God wants you and I to operate into. After seeing things, after seeing things, and after operating in the ability of word of knowledge, God expects you now to operate in the highest level of the prophetic, called the prophetic decree, where you operate like him. You decree things and they become as though they are. All right, praise Jesus. This is another topic, Trafuns and Badai. That is the part of uh, the prophetic office. So when a prophet studies the scriptures, he studies the scriptures from the lenses of a prophet. And when he teaches the scriptures, he teaches these particular scriptures as a prophet. And most of the time, when a prophet starts preaching, he sounds so demanding and arrogant. Our way together. Go study the Bible and see how these prophets used to operate. Most of them sounded so arrogant. If you if you read the Bible in the book of, uh, if you see the story of Elijah, what he did, he says that if I be a man of God, there shall not be rain upon this land for the next three and a half years. No, until at my own word. That's what the Bible says. If you meet a man of God who says such a thing, inside your mind you'll be like, ah, this man is so arrogant. Who gives him the audacity to speak such things? So when prophets start teaching, or rather when they prophesy, or rather when they teach, they sound so arrogant and very demanding and very authoritative. If you listen to them, you might mistake mistaken kwamba they are too proud. No, they are not proud. It is because whenever they operate in this office, uh, they are required to operate 
in authority. And this explains why when prophets in the Bible used to prophesy, they prophesied from a level of authority. And whatever they spoke, that's how it came to pass. An instance I've given you is when Elijah prophesied that there shall not be rain. He did that out of authority. And at the moment he said that, whatever he decreed, that's how it happened. Now, when you listen to these prophets, you'll end up thinking they are arrogant and they are very proud. So if you listen to these prophets, you'll understand that two offices, the apostolic and the prophetic, most of these men of God who operate in these two offices, I call them uh, territorial commanders. They look so arrogant when they teach and they sound so controversial when they preach. And that's why sometimes uh, whatever they teach might not stand well with some Overs. Let's go to the next office. Now, if you go to the third office, the evangelical office, when evangelists study the scriptures, most of the time they study from the lenses of an evangelist. And when they teach these particular scriptures, they teach from the compassion of God. And that is why when evangelists go out there to preach, they come back with souls after winning souls out there. Why? Because they express the love of God to many and these people get convicted and they get born again. All right? And that is why on a part of my evangelist, Wakitoko Okamba, for instance, the great evangelist Reinhard Bonke, when he was out there, whenever he used to teach, people used to get saved. Are we together? Why? Because he used to express the compassion of God through his teachings. Now, after he has uh, uh, preached this gospel and people have gotten saved, the new souls, the new converts are taken to church. Now, in church, they meet pastors. For pastors, when they study the scriptures, they study the scriptures from the lenses of a shepherd. The work of a pastor is to shepherd the souls that have been worn by evangelists out there. So when pastors, pastors start teaching the scriptures, they teach scriptures from the lenses of a shepherd. They will correct you, they will rebuke you. As a shepherd, you correct um, your flock. Are we together? That's how pastors are. And now when pastors teach, they sound a bit peer. Wanakwangana, the loving part, kama mzazi wako, siyo. Wukifanya makosa, anakuwa bibu. Wukifanya kitu cha kufuraisha, anakuambia congratulations. That's how pastors are. Now, if you understand these five offices, you will know that, hmm, kuna vile is natusaidia kwenye uh, Christ, CEO. Now, the last uh, office, which is the, the teaching office, of course, this is our office when, I, when I, the, the, the one who is called in this office, they say the scriptures from the lessons of, of a teacher. They don't shout when they preach. They teach you so eloquently. And by the time they have done with you, eh, after some of these teachers, when they teach, why? If you are used to revelatory preachers, CEO. Now, when you understand how these five offices operate, it gives you um, the ability to know why Pastor T sounded the way he sounded. Now, the reason why Pastor T sounded the way he sounded, it is because he is originally an apostle. If you are a keen follower of Pastor T, you will understand that he used to be called Apostle T. Mwangi, and he is originally an apostle. As an apostle, if he studied the scriptures, he will study uh, the, the scriptures from the lenses of an apostle, and most of the time, apostles sound controversial. And that is why this guy is um, this man of God, Amekua Nadis Vuta Nikuvuta Katia Yeye, Nawa Kenya Kada. Now, the question is, what do you need to do when a man of God teaches you something you disagree with? Well, number one, you need to know that it is okay to disagree with a teaching. It is not wrong, all right? And when a man of God teaches something you disagree with, what you need to do is test the spirit behind the teaching. The Bible says in the book of 1 John, I believe, chapter 4, if I'm not wrong, that uh, we are required to test every spirit. Why? Because we have different false uh, prophets out there who have, who have gone before us. So when a prophet approaches you, or rather when a man of God approaches you, please, with a certain teaching, test the spirit behind him so that you may know. Now, once you have tested the spirit behind him and found out that this spirit is not of God, please, it's okay. Just back off 
and uh, uh, and uh, just yani yani tu wachana na man of god why because let me let me tell you men of god are human beings they are not they are not angels all right they have mistakes sometimes they might say something that might not stand well with you and uh, you might be tempted to start attacking their office and that is the worst mistake you'll ever do as a child of god attacking the office of a man of god never attack the office of a prophet or the office of an apostle or the office of a pastor or the office of a teacher or an evangelist you see let me give you an example to ezekuelewa you can disagree with the president william ruto but do not attack the presidency why because the presidency is governed and guarded by law and if you attack the presidency you are trying to overthrow him all right and that is when apatanga uh, someone is charged of treason if you try to attack the presidency so when you attack the office of a man of god that is spiritual treason all right if you study the bible whenever uh, men gathered or rather ganged up and started attacking the office of men of god what followed next used to be jaw dropping experiences a good example is is a, a man called Korah in the bible Korah and his men came out and started attacking Moses and Aaron they started saying they can also be like Aaron and Moses eh, these are not the only people allowed to offer sacrifices in other words they were disapproving their offices but the bible says what happened next the ark opened up and swallowed Korah and all his men are we together because of his, their ignorance and their stupidity when it came uh, to the office of men of God. Now, from the story of Korah and his men, it's evident enough that we should be very careful when you open our mouths to challenge the office of a man of God. It is okay to disagree with them, but don't touch that office. The office is God given, not man given. And you know you can never fight God and survive. Are we together? And something else we should note is also in our country, uh, in Kenya, uh, it is so unfortunate that most of us have decided to unleash attacks on men of God. Men that have labored for the gospel for many years, we no longer honor them and we have been attacking them so badly. And I think we should also thank God because most of these men of God that we attack out here, they are very gentle, they are not easily provoked like other men of God from other nations. I know of a certain story of a lady from Nigeria, I guess, her name was, I think, Chioma Jesus. When she came out, she started insulting a certain man of God in Nigeria, and she unleashed endless attacks on this man of God. And somehow this man of God got provoked and decided to lay a serious curse on this lady. And eventually the lady died out of a strange sickness. Now, uh, from that story, uh, I know you might be wondering, am I trying to sell fear to you? No, I am not selling fear to you. I'm stating facts. You see, the same way you cannot insult your parents, I'm pretty sure the reason why you can never insult your parent or disrespect your parents, it is because you understand that it is your duty to honor your parents and, and to obey them and you are not supposed to disrespect them. At, you don't honor them because you are afraid of, of them punishing you. No, you honor them because you understand it's your duty to honor them. So the same way you should, you should not honor you, the men of God just because you are afraid of being cast. No, you should honor them because you understand that it's your duty as a child of God to honor them. It is so unfortunate that most of us, especially in the body of Christ, have ganged up against men and women of God who have labored for the gospel and who have become assistant Holy Spirit, trying to disapprove their offices, which is totally very wrong. And if we continue this habit, be guaranteed, the revival that most of us have been praying for for many years will not happen if we continue to dishonor these servants of God. That is a fact. 
If you study the Bible, where Jesus Christ was dishonored by his own people, the Bible records that he never performed any miracle in that area. Why? Because these people became too familiar with him. Actually, the Bible says when he started operating the supernatural, some were just like, uh, isn't this not, uh, the son of a carpenter? To them, Jesus Christ was not um, uh, uh, the Savior. To them, Jesus was just uh, the son of a carpenter. I wish they knew that Christ was more than a carpenter. But if you read this Bible, you find out that Jesus Christ never performed any miracle in his hometown. Why? Because they were too familiar with him. So if you become too familiar with these servants of God, be guaranteed they will not be able to dispense what God has uh, uh, for us through them. I'm just being honest with you. Well, with that said and done, if you are a child of God, please don't attack the office of a man of God. It's okay to disagree with them, but don't attack the office. It is very dangerous, very brutal. Take caution, please. Anyway, that is it for now. Thanks for watching. Let's meet next time. I've been your favorite host, Chief Okuzo. You can also leave your comments on down below what to be what you think about Pastor T and the entire lesson. Let's meet next time. Bye bye.